In this video, we're gonna talk about the Hardinge lathe conversion and everything I did to basically convert its power system and its control system over to something that I could run here in my shop. So in a previous video, we removed all the access panels and way covers and bellows off the machine to gain access to it. Um, the fun step, the next fun step would be to put servos on it to get it to move around. But the most logical step is just to get the spindle spinning to make sure everything in that area checks out. Uh, the bearings in this headstock are sealed bearings, so you can't easily replace them. Uh, so I wanted to double check that. I was 95% sure they were okay because this lathe is in mint condition um, when I bought it secondhand. And it's also an oil machine. So it doesn't run a water-based coolant, it runs oil which also means you don't have issues with the rusting because the machine is constantly being sprayed with oil, um, which is wicked for secondhand purchases. But still, anyways, something I wanted to check. The problem is the motor that spins the spindle is a 600 volt three phase motor, which I just can't run on residential power. Um, I could run, if I had half that voltage, I could run it. So I checked the motor to see if you could rewire it. Some motors, some three phase motors um, will have a breakout right in the main kind of access panel um, where you can change the way the coils are orientated um, to change the voltage requirements. You just up the current, reduce the voltage or vice versa. This motor did not. Uh, the wires led directly into the coils, but I assumed that they didn't use this motor just for 600 volt applications, like the internals of it, they probably used on other machines. So they probably made allowances so it could be wired to a lower voltage. Uh, one op or once I opened it up, I saw that it was a six pole motor and I could technically wire it down to a three pole motor and basically half my voltage requirements. The problem doing that is you reduce the torque by the same amount. Um, so as you can imagine, if you're pulling on a rotor with six poles as opposed to three poles, you have a different amount of torque to it. Do I need a lot of torque for turning half inch parts? Definitely not. So it was a gamble I was willing to take. Um, so we opened the whole motor up. We basically probed for all the coils. I found all the windings um, and basically just rewired coils from essentially a, uh, which would be a, like a series system down to a parallel system uh, to drop it down to the voltage requirements that I needed. Once again, this does horrible things with your power factors, but I didn't really, it didn't really bother me so much in this because I didn't need all those two horsepower. Like honestly, 500 watts would probably be plenty for most of my turning. Uh, so we tried that. I put it all back together, uh, re-laminated, rewire wrapped all the wires, hooked it up to a 220 volt VFD, and uh, we had it spinning wonderfully. So with that, I did some quick checks on the torque just to make sure the motor would still actually turn all the belts and pulleys because there's like 15 belts under this thing. Um, once I was happy that everything would work, I put the motor back in the lathe. And the next step was basically to bypass all the clutching mechanisms and all the mechanical speed changers to get the spindle spinning. So once we had the lathe spinning, I basically just let it run for a while, let the belts warm up, get the flat spots out of the belts. It's been sitting for years in one fixed position. So just kind of getting everything moving again uh, was the first step. The spindle is sealed, uh, so I wasn't worried about oilers having to pump oil through it or anything. So I could just run it for you know an hour or something like that and just make sure everything checked out. Um, everything did check out. <laughs> I ran a dial indicator across everything and all the specs were well within uh, the factory specs from when it was new. Uh, so that was a huge load off my mind knowing that the spindle and everything was perfectly good to go. I could focus on the rest of the machine. So when this machine was built, it was considered a super precision machine. Um, so its accuracies for a lot of measurements um, in the manual are sub 10th, uh, which is crazy, crazy high precision for me. Um, I didn't want to shortchange that by putting crappy stepper motors on it. So I went with NEMA 34 servo motors on both axes, on the Z axis and on the X axis. And I am incredibly happy with those. Uh, the X axis is coupled with the original belt system. Um, I had some reservations on whether that would introduce any kind of backlash, but it seems to be working out super well. And the Z axis I coupled directly to gain a little bit more rapid speed. I didn't need as high precision on the Z axis. And I think right now it has a positional accuracy of about two tenths on the Z and on the X it's sub tenth. Um, so most of my main issues would be diameter turning, which is where I want the higher precision, but I want higher speed on the Z uh, because threading and to get out of the way. Uh, every time it does a tool change, it has to move to the end of its travel and then move back to the cut. So waiting for a slow travel is just, it just adds cycle time. So if I could keep it fast and still have a balance of precision, that was the main goal for me. Another aspect of precision and repeatability is the way you're driving the servos. So when the servos are mounted on there, I use the clear paths. Um, they have an auto tune routine. So they tune themselves to the mechanical system that you've bolted them to. Uh, so they did their auto tune uh, hooked up to a computer via USB. It's actually pretty cool. They give you a ton of data that you can do all kinds of weird stuff with. Um, but the next thing to do was to drive those servos. So computer here, servos here, something in the middle. Um, I chose to use a Mesa interface card. Technically you could use a parallel port, which I've done on my old machines, but there's just not enough throughput and not enough uh, input output availability for me. So I used a Mesa interface card. And all that is is a little piece of hardware that the computer talks to and it handles all the specific timing requirements. It has its own dedicated chipset that basically just punches out um, information for the stepper motor or the uh, servo motors to read. 
and uh, just takes a little bit of load off the CPU. The CPU in this case was a Raspberry Pi 4. Um, it integrates directly with the Mesa card that I used, which is a 7C80. There's not a lot of information out on the 7C80 because it's a brand new card, and it was a bit of a gamble for me to try to use it, um, but I wanted a really tight package, and I, I just, I like Raspberry Pis. I think they're super cool little computers, and the actual, computing requirements for driving a CNC is really, really low. So I figured it would work fine and it's been working fine. I have it now on my mill and on my lathe and I'm very happy with their performance. Like I said, there's not a lot of info on there. So I'll link below, um, I'll have a link on my webpage, uh, including my INI file and my HAL file for both my mill and my lathe. Uh, so if you guys wanna tear through it and if you're having kind of a conversion issue yourself, you can kind of see how I set some things up. It might not all be accurate, but um, it's all there. With the spindle spinning and the servos now moving both axes uh, in a calibrated manner, uh, the next thing I had to do was get the oiler functioning correctly so I could start moving the machine around and start playing with it. Um, the oiler is just basically a system that pumps oil to all the little moving uh, sliding parts on the lathe uh, so they stay well lubricated. Um, it lubricates the ball screws, it lubricates everything on the machine. It's fairly important to get it going. Uh, you can mess around a little bit without them running but it's best to keep them going. This machine uses pneumatics for a ton of things. Uh, so it actually uses a pneumatic based oiling system. It pressurizes a big pneumatic chamber and then pumps oil that way. That was really easy because all I had to do was interface uh, basically a switch that turned on and off a solenoid that pumps oil to the machine at specific increments. The oiler on this machine could be controlled by the Mesa interface card, but honestly, there was a little clock motor in the back that just cycled the oiler on every 10 minutes. And uh, I decided to reuse that because it's one less IO thing I have to worry about and it constantly runs. Um, I hooked that up. I basically just hardwired it initially to be on so I could make sure oil was flowing out of everywhere it should be. Thankfully, none of the oil channels were clogged. Um, it was pretty much brand new oil in there, but I drained it, put new oil in there, um, got it running. And yeah, all the moving parts got well oiled. So uh, then I was able to move it around and do final checks and make Make sure there was no sticky spots or anything weird. Um, obviously, it just it checked out beautifully. It's the lathe is in great shape, so I, I can't complain about that. I got super lucky on the whole mechanical condition of this machine. At this point, we can now run the lathe and basically do some test cuts. Um, the oil for the whole cooling system on this lathe uh, hasn't been wired up and wasn't plumbed in yet, um, but I could run some simple test cuts in brass just to make sure the machine worked um, as it was intended. So after I did some more calibration values and checking backlash and checking adjustment of all the gibs and everything, uh, which were all within factory spec, amazingly, um, I ran some test cuts and was blown away by the accuracy of it. So I was, I'm used to my mill and my lathe, which are fairly low cost items. And just being able to hit like dead on tenth values without having to really put much effort into it was so, so awesome. Um, so I turned a few test parts, knowing that everything worked out really well. I decided to move ahead and basically plumb up everything else. The next most complicated part and the thing I was worried about most was the whole pneumatic system on this lathe. It has a pneumatic driven turret, which is lifted by air, which is driven by air. The call it closer is open and closed by air and the bar feeder is pushed by air. Everything is air powered, so it's just solenoids, but getting the logic to coincide with everything was difficult. I'll go over this part kind of quickly because unless you have this lathe, this isn't going to be interesting to you. But the turret on this lathe is an eight position turret. So it basically pops up, spins, and then drops back down to change your tool. It's lifted by air and it's driven by air, by an air motor. Um, those function kind of together. So interfacing them was a little bit difficult because as it lifts, it triggers a Hall effect switch. And as it spins, it goes through a Hall effect array. Um, it's basically a binary coded decimal system that pumps down the wire. But what I had to do is basically tell the Mesa card that the turret is up or the turret is spinning and when to stop it, it has a little pawl that it fires into the spinning turret um, that's cushioned also by air because why not control everything by air, um, <laughs> which stops the turret and lets it fall accurately on some alignment dogs. It's a really complicated system to work with and I understand why a ton of people just haul the air motor out of it and put a servo motor in there um, to control the turret because it's probably easier. But the air motor is really fast and it is super dependable assuming you get it working right, which I finally have working right now. Um, what I ended up using was someone else posted some C code that runs in the background that basically monitors the position of the turret and the position if it's up or down and tells Linux likewise. Um, thankfully, someone wrote this for this exact lathe, so I was able to basically cannibalize it. Once again, if you're really into that, you can see more in the HAL file and the INI file I linked, but I'm not gonna go over it in detail because that's just not interesting for anybody. The one problem with this machine running on air is it sucks air. It uses so much air. Um, it's kind of just known that these things use air. Uh, the call it closer by design, it just kind of bleeds air. 
Um, and the turret uses a crap ton of air because it's lifting the turret with air and it's spinning the turret with air. So uh, I figure it uses about 9 CFM when the turret is spinning, which is a fair amount of air at 90 PSI. That's a, you need a sizable compressor for that. My little itty bitty uh, compressor was working for all the testing, but to run it um, with more than, you know, two or three tool changes in quick succession, it would just, it just didn't have the reserve capacity. I could probably put a bunch of tanks in battery, but still it doesn't solve the issue of air supply. Uh, it just gives you more time. Uh, so I ended up buying a much larger um, air compressor to run this machine, which it runs probably 80% of the time just to keep up with it. Um, so eventually I will get a larger compressor, but this one is holding its own right now. I actually put some extra fans on it to help keep it a little cooler, um, but it seems to be working well and the price is right. With the turret functioning and the X and Z axis moving, um, the spindle spinning, the next thing to focus on was the collet closer and the bar feeder. I glaze over that turret thing like it was super easy. It was so hard. There was so much work that went into that and I spent days and days and days just going over the C code trying to get it to work. Anyways, not important to you, probably not interesting to you. Like I said, if you want the super geek details, I'll have a link to it. But if you're not building this machine, that's not really interesting to you. Uh, call it closer was very simple. It's pneumatically driven. Basically a solenoid opens it, a solenoid closes it. That was really easy to wire up and it's controlled by general M code and G code. So not difficult. The next thing was the bar pusher or the bar feed. Cause I had no idea. I had a box of parts that said it had a bar feeder, but I didn't understand how it worked. Um, when I started looking at the headstock, I noticed the inner bore of the headstock spindle was like a mirror finish, which seemed weird. Cause you have, you're gonna have bars whipping around in there. So it's gonna mar it up. Why is it mirror finish? I figured it out. Uh, I had something that looked a lot like a piston and this piston oddly enough fit perfectly in that sleeve. Uh, so basically the, the front of this piston was like a little uh, inverted cone so that it would hold a bar. Um, you basically take your bar and you put a slight chamfer on the back end. Anybody that knows has a bar feeder would understand this. Uh, but you put a slight chamfer on it so it stays centered. And then that piston uh, has air behind it and it's constantly pushing to try to push the work out of the end of the collet. Once you grip it with the collet, it doesn't go anywhere. And you can work on it and do whatever you want. And when you want a bar feed, all you do is you open the collet and the freaking rod comes shooting out. So what you do is you bring the lathe up to it. You have a work stop that bumps up into the work stop. You open the collet. It advances the rod out. So you back the carriage up to however much you want to advance out. And you reclamp and you keep cutting. Um, I know that because I've launched one bar out of the machine once. So now I know how fast rods can come flying out of the end of that cannon if, uh, if you don't have something stopping the rod from coming out of the cannon. Uh, so yeah, it works amazingly well and being air driven, there's really nothing to break down or anything. It just air pressure. As long as you have air pressure, it's going to bar feed. Uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pleased with that. It has an extension so you can do up to 12 feet if you wanted to. I don't have that extension, nor do I have the room for it. Um, I have a two foot feed capability in it right now, which is perfect because that's what I order my titanium rod cut to is two feet because it's better for mailing for me because I have to order it from far away. So yeah, that worked out amazingly well for me and it lets me bar feed parts so the machine can kind of run by itself. But Kurt, you ask, what happens to the part once you part it off? Does it just fall into the chip pan to be lost forever? And that's exactly not what happens. Uh, so on this machine, it also has a parts catcher and the parts catcher is driven by what? Air, because they can. So there's a little ram that drives a little ramp up below the spindle. Uh, it's controlled by an M code and a solenoid. Once again, not crazy difficult to interface with and standard G code exports to it as well. Uh, so when you're parting a part off, the little parts catcher comes whizzing up underneath the part, the part clinks into the little thing, runs down a chute and falls to a nice area. You can put a basket there, you can put whatever you want there. Um, so all your parts go into one location, not in the chip pan, which is ideal. Cause now I make these really tiny little thumb stud parts on this machine. And having those fall in the chip pan would just mean they're gone. Like you're not gonna find them. Um, with the titanium chips and whatnot in there, they're just invisible. Um, so having a little parts catcher that sorts them all into one location makes life so much easier. And when you combine that with the bar feeder, you, you have an automated system. You have a proper CNC, a bar fed lathe, which is amazing because it's just, for, for me working when I wanna work on multiple things at once, having a bar fed machine like this is just primo. So yeah. I like it. I may have glazed over the aspect uh, where I got the oil pump motor functioning to cool the cut. Um, basically the thing that pumps oil out of the sump onto your cut as it's happening to lubricate and cool it. Um, it was the same process as the main drive motor. I basically just took the motor apart and rewired it down from its 600 volts to 300 volts. Thankfully it was kind of the same pole arrangement. Six pole that I could drop down to a three pole. I could have changed that out for a simple motor. It's only one tenth horsepower. So I could easily find one of those at 220 volt as opposed to the 600 volt that it was. Um, but it had an integrated impeller 
directly coupled to the drive shaft and I didn't want to have to cut it and machine it and make it fit another one. So I tried to do the same process I did with the main motor and it worked out just fine. So that seems to be functioning great. And the flow is crazy high on it. Uh, like I've have it currently running on a VFD at about 40% power and uh, it's still more than enough for my needs. So that worked out well. With the lathe now lathing, uh, the last thing it had to do was cut threads. Um, Obviously there is a spindle encoder in this lathe. It took a little bit of finagling to work with it. It was putting out a sine wave, which is not the most crisp signal to interface with. So I put a little bit of hardware in the line um, before it got to the Mesa card, basically to clean that kind of gross sine wave up to a nice crisp square wave. Um, so I could detect exactly where all the positions of the spindle were and the index. And once I fed that into the logic controller, um, it produced some crazy nice threads. Um, it actually analyzes the position of the spindle about 10 times more fine than my mill did. And it also analyzes it about 10 times faster than my mill does. Um, so when you're cutting really fine pitch threads, uh, it's constantly monitoring where the spindle is and compensating with the carriage to get you a nice crisp thread. And it does threading very well. Who would have thought, you know, a machine that, you know, probably back in the day was, you know, $50,000 would cut threads well, but yeah, it cuts threads really well. The last thing on this lathe that I interfaced with, but I'm not currently using is the hydraulic cutoff tool. Um, I say hydraulic, it's kind of a pneumatic hydraulic system. It's essentially air pressure that pushes in fluid that drives the piston for the cutoff tool. Um, it's hard mounted to the spindle and it's basically just a dumb tool that just comes in at a fixed speed and parts off your work. What it does is it lets you free up a tool position by not having to have a cutoff blade, but I usually use my cutoff tool for a lot of backside chamfering and doing all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, so having that on the, on the turret itself is more useful to me. So I'm not currently using the hydraulic cutoff tool, but it's there. Should I ever need to use it? I don't foresee a need for it. Um, but if I really run out of tool positions, I always have it there available and just not interfacing with it right now because it's kind of a bear to work with. And honestly, I got tired of interfacing weird stuff on this machine. So once I had to do a functioning point, I was pretty happy going forward with that. I was lucky enough when I bought this machine, it came with a decent amount of tool holding. Uh, so I didn't really have to worry about that. You can still buy every tool holder from Hardinge. They just want so much money for it. Um, the nice thing is I can also buy any kind of seal or screw or fitting or whatever I want for this machine. They support almost every single part, but the tool holders I'm sure are kind of a custom one-off made part. So yeah, like a little, I'll show you. Like this little block right here. This is nothing fancy. This is actually a tool holder that I'm not even using, but I think this is like $300 if you want to buy through Hardinge. And that's like, that's a, that's a $50 part, maybe a $100 part at the best. I mean, it's a hard and steel part. Yeah, I get it. But yeah, they're going to one-off make this. So yeah, used market is the place for that kind of stuff. Anyways, I have enough for my purposes and it's set up now to turn every part of my pen. So yeah, it works out great. Ah, the light is coming in the window now. It's getting a nice, nice, nice light for the video. Anyways, <laughs> all done. Um, this took me about one month to convert. I started at the start of January. I finished at the end of January. It was my goal to basically get it running in one month. Um, it took me another month to convert all my CAD and all my machining operations to function well on this machine. And it took me about another month after that to produce my first run of pens, which I am super happy with. Um, there was just, I mean, going from a 300 pound machine to a 3000 pound machine, you're just, I mean, 3000 is a little excessive. It's probably about 2000, but anyways, um, just going to a much heavier machine and a much more accurate machine just produces better finishes. You just can't compete with that. I get why people buy big expensive CNC machines because you just can't compete with mass and precision. Um, but it also meant significantly less hand finishing for me, which is paramount because hand finishing is killing me. Like hand finishing pens is just something I can't scale. I just, I can't physically do this thing any faster than I'm currently doing it. So having this machine just reduce that by like 80%, which means I can produce the same quality items, but I can produce more of them. So yeah, I'm super pleased with this. I'm very excited to start working on the next batch, which I'm doing right after I finish editing this video. Yay. So that's it. That's the conversion in a nutshell of how I took this entire lathe and got it functioning on all the systems I run here. Since then, I've also converted my mill over to run on the Mesa card, um, just because I'm super happy with it. And just the boot up, it's like a two second boot up. Who doesn't like that? Um, so yeah, I'm very pleased. And it's not all interchangeable and all machines are now linked via network. So when I want to drop code on any one of them, I can just drag code onto them, which is super useful. In the past, I was using a USB stick to plug it into computers, which is just gets tedious. So being able to just live drop code, big fan of that. Throughout this video, there's been a bunch of weird aspect ratio clips everywhere. And that's because on my Instagram page, uh, there's like a three part 300 clip odd story of me retrofitting this lathe and going over every little detail uh, that I did to it. So if you're really into figuring out how exactly I wired up those motors or the leather weight covers that I didn't even talk about here or some of the tool holders or just other things I didn't have time to put into this video, you can go check that out. And that's, yeah, I think it's like two hours of just stupid detail. So if you're into that, check it out. If not, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.